Fernando's mother, Maria, arrived at my office frantic and concerned. This was my first time meeting her, and I soon found out that she only speaks Spanish. She told me that her son, who's HIV positive and gay, was alone in his apartment going loco loco. She said that he was having hallucinations, delusions, and mood swings. Fernando had been raped and infected with HIV at age 19. He joined my 50-person caseload two months after a psychotic break and subsequent suicide attempt. Prior to his mother's visit, he had been depressed but stable, so I was not particularly focused on him. But her visit changed everything. I became consumed by his case, and with his history of suicidality, I feared for his life. This was the biggest challenge that I've had since starting my work up in New York City. In New York, I'm a care coordinator for people with HIV and AIDS and several other chronic illnesses. But I was raised right here in Miami, and I even graduated on this stage nearly six years ago. Upon graduation, I went on to Brown University where I studied psychology and gender and sexuality and met the most inspiring peers, two of whom are in the audience today. After graduating, I made the obligatory 20-something pilgrimage to New York City and couch surfed until I joined the workforce. Since childhood, I've been passionate about social justice and equality. In addition to the diversity I was immersed in just by living here in Miami, my parents' embodiment of these values bled into my identity as I grew up. My father is a self-identified feminist whose mother passed the Equal Rights Amendment in the Florida House. And my mother has devoted her life to advancing social justice for LGBTQ and marginalized individuals. So it's no coincidence that I'm a cisgender ally, and I believe that everyone is equal and deserving of respect, regardless of socioeconomic status, ethnicity, sexual orientation, health status, or gender identity. I've always been committed to fighting for equality for the marginalized, but looking back, I recognize that I was actually skeptical of my ability to connect with these people that I was fighting for, because we seem so different, at least on paper. So I'm white, upper middle class, living in a private apartment, and HIV negative, but my caseload comes from a very different background. They're majority non-white, receiving cash assistance, living in subsidized housing, and HIV positive. And yet, a remarkable thing about my work and what I want to talk about today is that I've been able to gain a sense of connection with these clients that I never thought was possible. I took this job because I'm interested in psychology and I wanted to help people. But what I'm learning has been far more profound. I've come to realize that human connection and intimacy are essential, and we can build these connections where we don't think it's possible. Though this is relevant in my daily work with people with HIV, it applies to all of us, but I'm gonna explore how I encounter it in my daily work. As a care coordinator, I have a caseload of 50 HIV positive and chronically ill individuals for whom I serve as an escort and an advocate. They're all on Medicaid, and they, have, they receive cash assistance and food stamps from the state, but they often lack other stable resources. I work to maximize their adherence to their medical treatment and their medications in order to stably suppress the amount of HIV virus in their blood. These people have to take their medications every single day to prevent the virus from growing and weakening their immune system. So for example, I often pick them up at their apartments in the Bronx and take them to their doctor's appointments in Manhattan to ensure that they're getting the information and support that they need. But often my job goes beyond escort and advocate. Following Maria's visit, I spent hours and hours wondering how I was gonna help her son and help her. I have an undergraduate degree in psychology and only seven months of work experience. I'd studied Spanish for years, but I've never had to use it to express such complex emotional and psychological matters. I was only just beginning to understand Fernando's condition, and I now had to offer support and an explanation for his mother in a language that wasn't even my own. 
His mother and I had to decide whether or not to commit him against his will to a psychiatric hospital. That choice fell to me. I knew that that decision would have a humongous impact on his life, and I felt so ill-equipped to make it. So I consulted his doctors and I, his psychiatrist and a mental health crisis hotline in an effort to figure out what to do. I arranged for a mobile crisis unit to assess him, and I went to visit him at his home. When we arrived, he was convincingly composed, and as always, his hair was perfectly cut and sculpted. He was deemed not severe or psychotic enough for hospitalization. I resigned myself to the unit's decision to refer him to outpatient services, but I still couldn't shake the image of him alone and vulnerable to his suicidal contemplations and frightening delusions. I kept picturing him at the airport, scared and frustrated, where he'd gone multiple times with his suitcases packed, believing that a prince had bought him a ticket to Italy that did not exist. A week later, he called the police saying that someone was at his apartment threatening to shoot him. This was another one of his hallucinations. It was only then that he was committed to a psychiatric hospital, and while I was hugely relieved that he was now safe, I still felt preoccupied. While visiting him in the hospital, I learned more of his history of trauma and of his frightening delusions, but I struggled with how to best communicate with him. Whenever he asked me multiple times why he was in the hospital, I felt uncomfortable explaining that his mother, his, the police, and I all thought he was delusional. How does one interact with psychosis? How was I going to begin to connect with someone who was so detached from my reality? And then there was his mother, awaiting my input and translation of the doctor's updates. I realized that I, a 23-year-old with little experience in rusty academic Spanish, that I was one of the few resources that she had to ensure her son's safety. But despite my inexperience or naivete, we developed a bond and an alliance. His mother and I talked at least once a day for several weeks, and we admitted to each other that we were scared. We were scared of his hurting himself and of his hurting us if he was psychotic and aggressive. But despite our differences, Maria and I developed this bond. And following one of our visits with Fernando in the psychiatric hospital, she gave me a loaf of bread that she had just bought. Maria was on food stamps, but she insisted that I have it. Her trust and care touched me over and over again. Connection happens. And it doesn't can happen without reason. It occurs most obviously where it's lacking. And what I want to explore today is how it's happened in my work, how I've become a primary support for people like Fernando and his mother, and why this connection matters. I worry that with the advancement of HIV treatments, we all think that HIV has been conquered and we can move on to the next epidemic. And while people can live longer lives and can survive the disease for longer and have much fuller lives, many people still face a social stigma of being HIV positive. And this stigma can be very socially isolating. I have many clients who isolate themselves from romantic relationships or family because they're ashamed or they are afraid that they'll be ostracized if they tell someone their status. There are numerous support group discussions around this single act of disclosing one's HIV status to their loved ones. I've heard many of my clients speak as though they're not worthy of love. As one of my elder clients put it, she, feels she doesn't pursue romantic partners because she feels bad asking someone to put something on every time they have sex. This stigma instills shame, and that shame can be very isolating. Then when you add other marginalizing factors to the mix, such as an ethnic minority status or an LGBT identity, this isolation is exacerbated. And isolation and shame prevent people from going to the doctor or seeking help, putting them at further risk for mental and physical decompensation. 
which in turn leads to more isolation and shame, and this vicious cycle takes hold. My job exists to act as a bridge between the ill and impoverished and the resources available to them. But the success of this work relies on the building a bridge between the two of us. So how does connection happen? I often think that my white privilege puts me at a disadvantage. Why should these people trust me if my life looks so different from theirs? How could I possibly understand their problems if I've never had to use the welfare system or been chronically ill? Well, a lot of people tell me that just showing up is what gains my clients' trust. But I think that showing up is the easy part. I think that you have to show up and make people feel worthy. You have to treat them with respect and withhold any judgment about their lives or their choices. And you have to share their vulnerability. Only then do you connect and only then can you build their trust. Respect is recognizing the difficulty of my client's struggles and not questioning their validity. It's withholding, telling them what I think they should do when it sometimes seems obvious. Non-judgment is not shaking my head or sighing when they speak of relapsing into drug use or missing a few medicine doses. And non-judgment is not assuming what that behavior means and instead asking them how they feel about it. And lastly, I think vulnerability can be the key to alliance. By fighting with the fight alongside with my clients, I feel like an equal. I didn't know how I was gonna help Maria so I started by being vulnerable. I didn't act like I was unfazed or unafraid or certain of what to do. I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a mother. I'm definitely not Puerto Rican or schizophrenic. But side by side, Maria and I were learning about schizophrenia firsthand. We both had to decide what to do to ensure her son's safety. I was continuously moved by her strength and devastated by her sadness. And she was grateful for my help and trusted me to do the best that I could. We were able to truly share this frightening experience and be vulnerable with one another. And it's this kind of sharing of experience that enables us to build a connection that has nothing to do with the differences in our backgrounds. Similarly, when I stand in line with my clients to certify their food stamps, we're in this fight together. After waiting for hours just to find out that we've been in the wrong line, we both get chewed and reprimanded by the impatient caseworker. And I don't stand there thinking that I deserve better treatment. We both deserve better treatment. And we both des deserve not to feel alone. This human connection is essential. But it doesn't just apply to these people with HIV. This message applies to all of us. Many studies show that per having perceived social support has direct positive outcome on mental and physical health. People with HIV who have a good relationship with their doctor are way more likely to take their medications every day. But like I said, this doesn't just apply to people with HIV. There's an epidemic of loneliness in our country, and it's literally killing us. We all know that the extra weight we carry around can contribute to diabetes and heart disease. But what we don't ever hear about is the damage that social disconnection does to our health. Feeling isolated is, an early, is a risk factor for early death comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. I have a client who's HIV positive and he has kidney disease, hearing loss, a history of multiple heart attacks, and the list keeps growing. We probably don't have enough tools in our medical toolkit to keep him going much longer, but I can offer him my company, which is all he's really asking for. When I volunteered on a suicide hotline two years ago, I never encountered someone who was acutely suicidal. Instead, I frequently spoke with the same few callers every shift who seemed to lack any apparent critical need. I thought this was a waste of time. 
I didn't think that we were serving the target population and we were instead clogging up the hotline with these non-suicidal callers. But I realized that they had a different motivation for calling. These people were lonely and they just needed somebody to listen. They may not have had anybody else in their lives who would listen to them and they may have felt shame about the pain they were feeling and not wanted to tell anybody. My, my work has repeatedly shown me that we all need to be heard and we all deserve that. What I'm trying to demonstrate is that it doesn't take that much to be there for each other. Despite our differences, we could all use social connection. And we physically need these bridges to connect us. As I said, my work has repeatedly taught me that people need to connect, and I keep seeing that people are lonely, and racism and silence can, racism and stigma can silence many. But my work has taught me something even bigger, that I need to connect. The first time one of my clients gave me a hug, I was so excited that I ran back to my office and I told every single person there. It's okay to admit that we're sad or lonely and we need to talk about it. The biggest myth about suicide is that asking someone if they're going to commit suicide will cause them to try it. This is not true. If someone is lonely enough and lost enough to want to end their lives, being asked, are you okay? Or being told, I'm here to listen, is probably welcomed and always needed. So I want to think about the power of those five words. I am here to listen. The next time you're on the phone with your sibling who won't stop complaining about their job or their relationship and you're thinking, oh God, this never ends. Instead, try giving affirmation. I'm here to listen. I have found that being on both sides of that phrase can feel really, really good. Despite our many differences, we can all feel lonely and we can all be an open ear and open mind for each other. Though I encounter this in my daily work, it really applies to all of us. I hope to become a therapist to provide this validation and support for people who need it. I want to spread openness and compassion in my communities. And I'm so glad that I've learned the power of respect, of non-judgment, and of allowing myself to be vulnerable in building these crucial con connections that I crave, that Fernando's mother needed to make it through, and that we all need to survive. Thank you.